We have received many questions for this event this evening, uh, and we have reached out to those of you whose questions were pertinent to the topic, and we'll be inviting you to raise the question during the question and answer session. Now, if time permits, we would invite comments and questions from those of you who have might not have the opportunity to send us through your questions. I would now like to invite the High Commissioner to make his opening remarks to frame tonight's conversation. Over to you, High Commissioner. Well, good evening to everybody, particular, particularly Lisa and Sahail. Um, uh, as the year is coming to an end, I know it's got a couple of weeks to go, but we're getting there. I just want to thank you all for making time to connect to us uh, through this series. And I look forward to staying in touch with you uh, virtually uh, next year, but hopefully uh, as uh, vaccines start to arrive, uh, we may even run into each other. Um, like so many other things we took for granted, cricket was one of those things that came to a standstill at the outset of this wonderful year. Cricket and sport more generally, of course, is closely associated with a sense of community, of coming together to enjoy a game away from the rigours of modern life. And at a time in COVID when we could have done with that, of course, the pitches were empty, the balls were grounded, uh, and the bats were silent. Uh, however, I'm pleased to see that the game of cricket appears to have adapted to the new environment, as we all have, and is helping provide much needed respite and entertainment after what's been a challenging year. And of course, it started with the great effort of the Indian Premier League, uh, which had record television and digital viewership, uh, uh, given the restrict, despite the restrictive arrangements uh, uh, on attendances away from home uh, in the UAE. Um, despite all of those obstacles, uh, it entertained us as ever, as we watched some great batsmanship, we watched some great bowling, and regrettably, uh, we saw Mumbai win again. And he says that as a Delhi Capital supporter. Uh, and I, and I, I really did enjoy Shreya's eyes captaincy this year, but uh, I'm certain we'll get Mumbai uh, next year. Uh, it's been remarkable to witness uh, the IPL's successful transformation as it had to implement complex protocols and logistics to, to secure that uh, uh, COVID-free bubble for its players and its teams. And as I was saying to Sahail earlier, uh, it's something that other sports in Australia model themselves on uh, during our rugby league and our Aussie rules season. This has allowed uh, uh, IPL to bounce back and kept us all engaged in the action despite being from home. So, so um, I can confess I haven't seen any of the first day of the Australia India Test match today at the Adelaide Oval, uh, but I'm sure you'd agree it was great to see the start uh, of what is going to be an excellent series. The fact that it's happening, the fact that we can watch it on TV here in India, the fact that uh, 21,000 spectators can be back in the stands in Adelaide, uh, even if it's half capacity, is tremendous. And uh, from all accounts, the quality of cricket being played between Australia and India over the past several several weeks has been outstanding, and it should be should be a should be a great series. Uh, my family and friends back home tell me uh, of the relief of being able to watch cricket this summer, uh, because in Australia, summer. Uh, without cricket is somehow just not right. It's like Bollywood without SRK or or Dar without Roti. Uh, but I'm glad to see players on the pitch, friends in the stand, and I are now our respective cricketing bodies, the BCCI, and I'm catching up with Mr Ganguly on Saturday, and Cricket Australia will be doing all they can to make sure uh, these, these series continue. So the success of the ongoing Australian-India tour has been demonstrate, has demonstrated uh, how sport can help overcome adversity uh, in this year. It's achieved it within our communities, despite all the challenges we've faced individually and collectively over the past 10 months, as we've adjusted to a different way of living, working, engaging and playing sport. Um, uh, what our two national teams and governing bodies have been able to rise to and overcome these challenges in order to bring us this great game is a triumph for our country, uh, for our cricket code itself, for the players uh, and for the administrators who all don't always get the credit uh, uh, that they can, uh, that they deserve. Um, uh, as the first test match between Australia and India started today at the Adelaide Oval, and with the difficulties faced by our respective teams, governing bodies and fans this year, there's never been a more interesting time to talk uh, cricket, and that's why I'm delighted to be with you tonight with our excellent alumni panellists, Lisa and Sahail, who, as you know, are highly respected on this subject and know more about it than probably anyone else who's tuned in. So. Uh, it's terrific to be with you tonight. Thank you again to uh, Lisa and Sahail. Thank you for everybody who's tuned in this year. And of course, we all know what our wish for next year is, which is a year that's a bloody lot better than this year. <laughs> Thank you very much, High Commissioner. Uh, now I'd like to invite Lisa to discuss the current test match 
and uh, some of the recent one day international matches um, uh, played between Australia and India in Australia and to share his perspectives on how the game has had to adjust uh, due to COVID. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Well, obviously, unlike um, Barry, I, I did tune in for the first ball. It's almost become a little bit like the Ashes rivalry where you have to see the first ball. Um, and I was pleased from an Australian perspective. Uh, second delivery, Australia was able to pick up a wicket, Prithvi Shaw. So India won the toss and elected to bat. I can tell you at the moment it's six for 212. Rindabin Saha and Ravi Chandran Ashwin are in. And it's this time of period in the pink ball test where it gets a little bit interesting for the bowlers. But one thing that we have seen um, when India and Australia play when it comes to cricket, and it's not just the men's cricket, it's also the women's cricket as well. There's a great relationship that is forming and it's formed probably over the last decade and especially we've seen because of the IPL, um, it's allowed other players to get to know the Indian players and also get to know what Australians are like, what the banter is like, how much we actually like you if we're taking the mickey out of you. Um, so these type of things are really evident in the current series. And we saw that in the one day series where uh, I think Aaron Finch got a little bit injured and KL Rahul kind of went up to him and says, mate, you're fine, carry on, that doesn't hurt. Um, there is that great relationship, but the rivalry is fierce simply because the teams know each other so well. Um, one thing that I've been fortunate enough to do over probably the last six years um, is through commentary is to spend time in India and spend a lot of time in India and, and obviously catch up with Sahail when, I, when we're in town together. But um, the one thing that stands out to me is um, India is such a hospitable country um, and for someone who loves cricket as much as I do, when you go to India and the IPL, I kind of liken it like a big country town that has a circus going on and everyone's talking about it. The difference, though, in India is that over a billion people are talking about this one tournament um, and they're living and breathing every moment and they're probably better cricket pundits than I am because they literally watch every ball. Um, but there is certainly a lot of mutual respect there between the two countries and I think... Um, in general, in 2020, and especially Australia has done it pretty tough in the sense that we had the bushfires to start with and then obviously the pandemic. Um, one thing that has brought everyone together is sport um, and the pleasing thing <laughs> was that obviously um, the test series over in, in England was the one that first started, but everyone was hanging out for the IPL and we were able to witness some great cricket. And no doubt um, this a test series that has just started is going to be just as good. Thanks for that, Lisa. I, I think it's, uh, from what you just said, it's fair to say that uh, Australia and India are great mates, but probably uh, better rivals. <laughs> now maybe to our next expert, Sahel. Sahel, tell us where you see the IPL heading this year. Um, well, we're coming to the end of the year, so maybe this year and next. And uh, what are your thoughts on India's performance in Australia over the recent weeks as well? Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, Lisa, great to, to see you digitally, as always. Uh, it would be great to catch up, actually, again. But, uh, yeah, the way things have panned out, it's been a, it's been a strange one, but hopefully soon as well. Uh, yeah, just coming to, to, I guess, the IPL first. Uh, look, I think it brings a lot of perspective in, like I said. I think that's sort of been my word of 2020. Uh, for me, the experience was... Uh, very different, very unique, uh, very rewarding, but at the same time, very challenging. Uh, we love you uh, during the IPL. Uh, sorry, can you hear me, guys? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Sorry, I think my pod just went dead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, like I was saying, I think for us, uh, it was a bit of a challenge initially because we, we lost Dino pretty early on in the IPL. And uh, in a way, it was a unique, very difficult challenge for a lot of us that knew him well. But at the same time, I think it brought up a lot of us together as well. It sort of brought that intense environment even closer. And so for me, the IPL, apart from what was happening on the field, which was incredible, because I think in an increasingly polarized and divided world today, we need hope and change. And sport is always that powerful tool that helps us connect with one another beyond those existing boundaries. Uh, you know, it looks at what unites us before what separates us. It, it rekindles positivity. And we saw all of that through the IPL. We saw incredible numbers it was very rewarding in that sense uh, but it was so different right seeing the IPL as Lisa said 
Uh, normally, it's like this 1.2 billion person circus, the largest circus in the world, clearly. Uh, that is just an unbelievable echo of sound, right? I remember being at the 2019 final, doing an interview uh, with Sachin just before the toss. And I I'm not even kidding. I have goosebumps talking about it because the whole stadium was reverberating, right? And, and that's sort of what we're used to. So to not have that was obviously a very different experience. But at the same time, to still have pulled off an IPL, uh, testament to everyone that worked on it, the players, uh, all the, the broadcast staff, the, you know, the, the network. We had 420 people locked up in a biosecure hotel for two and a half months. We, we were away from our families and friends, and uh, that was sort of the way it went. And given that the IPL coming up is, is three months away, I, I don't see it changing. I, I just think you know, there's no real vaccine in sight, and if, even if there is, there's, there's issues with it at the, at the moment, and by the time it reaches us, because we're not the ones that really need it at this point, uh, I don't think we should be receiving it anytime soon. Uh, so I, I do think the next IPL is going to be similar and uh, it's the way of the world. I think this is the new normal. We've got to get used to it and uh, just got to see the positives of what they are. It's it's very easy to look at the, the negatives, but I think the values of mateship, of hard work, of excellence, um, of sportsman spirit that are shared across various sports, all of that's coming through still. And I think that goes beyond borders. It goes and transcends racial and cultural differences. And I think that's what's important in we're seeing that in a series like India Australia as well. I think uh, the spirit in which it's being played, uh, as Lisa mentioned as well, it's very special to see, and I think that's uh, going to continue uh, into the near future and beyond. I think it's it's a very special rivalry that's built up. It's uh, I totally agree with Lisa. I see India and Australia being, uh, and I wrote an article about it recently, being the new India Pakistan or the new Ashes. It's it's as big and it's as competitive. Thank you for that, Sahel. Um, I guess uh, hearing from you both reinforces the message that, uh, you know, despite the challenges we've had to face this year, and the High Commissioner obviously mentioned this as well, that sport, sport's one of those things that brings people together, and cricket in particular, it's, it's given us the ability to to be able to, to get through what's been quite a difficult period. So thank you to the IPL, thank you to the players, um, and to everyone else, uh, because you're keeping the fans happy. Now, look, before I draw the audience into this discussion, uh, Lisa, Sahail, I was wondering if there are any other comments or points that you uh, might like to make uh, or respond to, um, which came to mind as you listened to one another just now. And I would, in particular, welcome any thoughts you might have on how Australia and India are seeking to revive cricket at the lower levels as well. Obviously, uh, the big leagues, the IPL um, and the, uh, the One Day International uh, series up and running, um, but cricket at the lower levels uh, in community groups as well, um, obviously, uh, you know, difficult to get back up and, um, and playing on the fields again. So I'd be very interested in hearing from you both uh, on those two aspects. Thank you. Yeah, I might, I might kick it off. I, you know, we, we talk about the fact that, you know, this wonderful series that we're about to see um, and the test match between the Australian men's and, and the Indian men's side. The unfortunate part really is that the Indian women haven't had an opportunity to really play um, the last time they played as a team for their country and represent their country was that T20 World Cup final and how can we forget it, the MCG in front of 86,000. That was my eight. And we're already in December and there is there doesn't seem to be a schedule yet where the women have been put down to, to play a series against someone. They had a couple of games in the women's uh, IPL exhibition matches, which was really important. But I know, um, and speaking to a number of players, and Sahail can back me up as well, domestic cricket for both men and women, there is so many states that are playing. How do you get them into a bio bubble? Um, and I guess the main thing is, and, and I, I probably, you know, reaching out to administrators or people that are listening with some influence is, I know that there are a lot of difficulties in India, but you've got to somehow find a way. Um, we find a way for the elite, the top, because that's where the money is. But the biggest growth area in the game is women's cricket. And unfortunately, that's kind of taken a bit of a hit. So um, ideally, you know, I understand the difficulties that national boards are having, but I'm sure there is a way that we can make it work um, because certainly you don't want India to be left behind from a women's cricket point of view. And all of those domestic players that are just sitting there on contracts training but training for what? And as, a, as an athlete, you're always striving towards something. And when you don't have that goal to achieve or something to look forward to, it's very hard to keep 
focused on that purpose. Yeah, I think I totally agree with uh, what Lisa said, and I think I'll take it beyond cricket as well. I mean, firstly, just starting with cricket, I think it's hard to assume that we're past the difficulties of the COVID-19 era just yet. I mean, you look back at the England-South Africa series recently, and they had to cancel, uh, you know, recent games because of a breach of protocol, and, and it put the safety of players at risk. But I think coming to Lisa's point, we we see, as Lisa said, the the elite level not affected as much, right? And we're seeing it affected, but not as much because the money's there, as Lisa said. But when you look at the women's game, when you look at junior cricket, you look at domestic cricket and club cricket, the trouble is that there has to be money for even clubs to survive. And we're talking about survival, simple survival of younger clubs, uh, people's livelihoods. Uh, and I'm talking about groundsmen, of, of staff, of, uh, I mean, my local club here, the, the Cricket Club of India in Bombay, we're paying for the groundsmen and we're all chipping in because the club has refused to do so in some senses. There's other places that are doing the same. So. Again, I agree with Lisa where I think the government needs to step in, subsidize certain things. There has to be protocols that come into place to allow for, for fresh play as well. As we're doing with top elite gyms across cities in India today, where we've got little signs that go on and say sanitize, unsanitized. I think if we want to, we can take these steps and measures to do the same for, for dressing rooms and for, for you know cricket grounds that are available to play because uh, you know, I, and I'm not talking about just cricket here. You know, I've been talking to a lot of Olympic athletes. We've got the Olympics around the corner if it does happen. And we've got Olympic athletes like shuttlers and, and table tennis players and many others. I was talking to a table tennis player the other day who's one of India's most seasoned campaigners who's only been walking up, running up and down a staircase and doing indoor activities. He's got a little machine set up. But again, this is just putting him three steps behind when other athletes around the world are, are moving forward even at these times because they're opening up quicker. So I do think that while we're in this race against COVID, we're also sort of in a race against anxiety, against depression, against performance and performance anxiety and, and lives. I mean, these are, you have to understand sport is a career. Sport is a life for a lot of us. And I think, um, you know, we have to get it back and running in some way or form. And I think it starts at that grassroots and, and club level because if you, if, you, if you nip it in the bud there, you're not going to see the next generation of sportsmen. They're going to be sitting on their games playing eSports and they'll be in the next Olympics as eSports e gamers because that is uh, seeing a massive boom. But I think the, the real charm for purists like me and I think Lisa as well is to, to see the battle of sport on a, on a field. Thank you for that, Sahil. Maybe... Uh... Uh, Commissioner, you and I can start practicing our uh, esports uh, skills, so maybe we can make it to the Olympics. When, when I was a trustee of the Sydney Cricket Ground, we actually we actually sponsored. Uh, I think we owned a esport team, and uh, part of that, of course, uh, as both of you would understand, is that uh, stadiums are only used for certain numbers of times during the year. And yet, you look at these big esport uh, competitions, and they fill stadiums to watch people playing computer games. Yeah. Some of my age doesn't get that, but. Uh, but, but people people that run stadiums do. Anyway, we're not here to talk esports. <laughs> Look, um, thank you, uh, Sahil. Thank you, Lisa, for those for those additional thoughts. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now to uh, our audience, and I understand that we have uh, a couple of questions from 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 members of the audience here. Uh, I believe the first question um, we have is. And look, I, I do apologise. You're really going to have to forgive me. Um, so calm. We have Sukam on the line. I can tell you that. No. So ask the question. Okay. Well, this this question came from uh, Sukam Manil Kumar, uh, and it was a question for you, High Commissioner. Um, the question is: uh, Any initiatives by the Australian alumni to strengthen sporting ties between India and Australia? And uh, we might have Disha on the line as well, who might have something to say in response to this question. Uh, Hello. Disha's there, yes. Hi, Disha. Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Barry. Um, and yeah, uh, the question I think was, uh, what is the Australian alumni network doing and uh, the association doing? And I think uh, this is where I step in and say, yeah, we've uh, been seed funded. Uh, they've seed funded sports scene, uh, which is uh, a platform. So we're bringing in technology to help sport in India. Like uh, Suhail and Lisa just pointed out, there's a lot to do in the women's space as far as sport is concerned. 
there's generally a lot to do in the sport uh, arena in India and uh, things that need to be planned. And technology is doing a lot of things in this space. Uh, so the AAAI has a seed funded sports team, uh, which is a technology platform that will allow for aspiring uh, athletes uh, and you know uh, sports enthusiasts, uh, as well as amateur athletes from anywhere around uh, uh, the country to be able to find game time as well as earn that little bit of money that Suhail was just talking about, saying, you know, these, these are careers that people uh, are then going to go make out of themselves. And uh, that is what sports scene is going to do. Uh, it's, going, it's going to allow for um, people to find game time as well as earn money while they're doing it, as well as provide sort of an ecosystem uh, where we can bring in elements of training and nutrition sciences, uh, you know, supported by various universities from across Australia. Um, and yeah, it's uh, a big stride. Uh, the product is currently under development and uh, we're hoping uh, to be out in the market before mid next year. Uh, and we're looking at uh, Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the most densely populated states uh, to see uh, the first uh, the first launch of the product. Uh, very excited. Uh, and yeah, thank you again, all of you for helping this actually even happen. And just as a, just as a general comment, Christian, I, the fact that this year, we've learned how to use this type of technology which has been around for a while means that the capacity for us to connect between different sports in australia and india uh, and assist in a variety of ways you know simple things like uh, uh, how do you run a membership list or, or or more complex things is you know the coaching side of it you know people have people have been continuing and learning yoga virtually this year i reckon if you can learn yoga virtually you can just about learn any sport yeah, Lisa has been coaching online as well, which has been great to see. So, I mean, I think, yeah, yeah it's, it's the new normal is is, is taking in uh, different shapes and forms, I think, which is great to see. I'm still due a lesson, Lisa. <laughs> you are due. <laughs> You'll be we pleased to know, actually, Sahail, I've been playing a bit of golf, so. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Good. We're on soon. Yeah. Our, our second question is from uh, Victor Tarapore. Uh, Victor, do we have you on the line? Victor was on the line. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Over to you, Victor. Good, good. Oh, sorry, do you want me to ask? Yes, you yes. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so, firstly, thank you um, for giving us some time from your busy schedules to be with us. So I've just got a two parter. The first is uh, when do you see the sports landscape return to a state of normalcy or semi normalcy? Um, not just in Australia, but in India as well. And the second one is more of a personal one for me. What future opportunities do you see for uh, analytical sports broadcasters in Australia? Because currently I'm working part, uh, as part of uh, the broadcast network for the IPL, but I'm just looking at other perspectives as well. Thank you. Do you want to go first, Lisa? You can go first. I always go first. <laughs> so, so just addressing the first part of the question, because I think uh, the second part's more uh, tuned to you, Lisa, uh, in terms of the sort of uh, scene in Australia at the moment. But Victor, coming to your first question, I think uh, it's going to take a little bit of time, but I think it's down to each board and each sport individually, right? I think uh, cricket and the IPL has taken a big step forward. I know motorsport in India uh, has taken a step forward in terms of uh, adapting to protocols and, and putting strict things into place and there's more events starting up. Table tennis hasn't, badminton hasn't. Uh, obviously contact sports, I think is gonna be a, a bit of an issue as well. I mean, uh, Kabaddi, I know the league has been pushed back and canceled this year, which is a, a big uh, you know loss to a lot of the players and their livelihoods as well. It's been shifted forward. Boxing is the other big issue. And I think the trouble is a lot of the boards are fighting within themselves. Right? And I think uh, that's been uh, the big, big problem for a lot of these sports. But from a normalcy perspective, I don't see why there has to be any more time beyond, say, another few weeks from now or even now, because we've seen it working. If you can pull off the IPL where you've got uh, eight teams, you've got you know thousands of people involved and pull it off successfully with very, very minor hiccups. Uh, and Victor, you were part of the bubble with, with me at, at Star and we had 450 people at, at one hotel, no hiccups whatsoever. We, we got through multiple challenges and got it done. And I think that's a blueprint, but I think for sports to want to do it and governments that want to do it, and I mean state governments, I don't mean uh, central governments, state governments need to say, hang on, we want sport to return and set a benchmark. Because I think governments like Orissa are, are moving forward in sport, Haryana, for instance, as well. And I just think each state needs to take that responsibility and do it 
for a sense of pride. And I think, you know, Australia seems to have that in some sense as well, where sport needs to become part of the social fabric, right? When I spent five years there, I understood that. There were people who would go to work riding a bike in a suit and wear ASICs at the bottom, right? It's just part of the fabric. And I think that needs to come into to India to understand the pride that sport carries for the elite level all the way down to the junior level. And I think that's when we'll see it resume to normalcy. So sadly, I don't think there's a number as to when it will resume. And I think it's sport led, uh, but I don't think we're far from it uh, in terms of opening up at least. Yeah, just just to add to that, especially in Australia, and, and Barry can probably attest to this, the states and the state premiers, boy, they love it when, you know, New South Wales beats uh, Queensland and, and we saw um, Queensland government allow the AFL grand final for the first time um, to be played outside of Melbourne and that was a big thing. So I think it's really important for states within India um, and potentially states that have the pandemic a little bit more under control, they can own a sport. I mean, the main thing is broadcast rights, just getting it on TV and getting it into um, a safe bio bubble so that it can continue to go on, which is what the IPL was able to show. So it has been done. It can be done. I guess the real question, it hasn't been done in India as yet. Um, and, and I guess that's the main question, isn't it, Sahail? You're mute. Can't hear you. <laughs> this is great. As a good presenter, you can't hear him. You're fine now. <laughs> oh, you're gone. What's just the hell? I think Mumbai's gone offline, have they? We can still see you, though. Actually, but I'll, I'll answer Victor's second question while Sahel figures that one out. And when you said, um, Victor, an analytical broadcaster, what did you mean from from a stats point of view or yeah. a pure broadcaster? Uh, a mix of the two, but leaning more towards the stats side. So we have uh, folks like myself uh, in the broadcast room where uh, we feed numbers on air and uh, we're just yeah. thinking about what the opportunities might be in Australia. Uh, there's heaps of opportunities. Um, Arun actually from India normally comes out to look after the Channel 7 coverage um, for all of the test matches and uh, the Big Bash. And we're actually looking for more and more stats people. Uh, gone are the days that you had um, someone just literally scoring for you to let you know how many dot balls and, you know, how many singles or boundaries were scored after the last four or five overs. But more it's about, remember, match two back in, you know, IPL to the match when, you know, uh, Rohit Sharma did this and you've got to find it for us. Because as commentators, and, and Sahail will attest to this, um, you guys actually make us look really good, really smart, that we, you know, that we remember everything. Um, but really, we've got an idea of something and you guys are feeding it to us and you're listening to what we say. So um, I think you guys are absolute gold um, and I would not go into a cricket broadcast without one by my side. So um, certainly here in Australia, it, it's tr we're training a lot of people up at the moment. Um, simply because there, there aren't that many that understand the game or even from a T20 perspective, how you break it down. And obviously now in the Big Bash, we've got three new rules. So how does that affect tactically? This is, this is, um, this is the stuff that you guys like. Um, we put everything in a spreadsheet and tell us if there's a pattern or not. So, um, yeah, there is a big interest and it happens in all of our sports. So, um, if you've got more interest, um, if you've got another interest in another sport other than cricket, um, certainly there'd be a fair bit of work here. Yeah, just to add to what you said, Lisa, I think, um, uh, Victor, the other, the other side of things is the OTT side, right? Uh, and even new emerging platforms that are coming through. You look at Dream 11 today, Dream 11 is no longer just a fantasy game. Dream 11's moved into streaming rights. Dream 11's moved into their own content creation. Suddenly, there, there's need for, for statsmen, right? And for statisticians, for, for data uh, you know, side of things, uh, for engineers within the game as well, and, and creation of, of new uh, sort of uh, understanding of how to read sport. Uh, you're seeing that across other sports as well. I mean, we're doing it. I've got a startup called Kabaddi Adda, and we're doing it within Kabaddi. We're using AI and machine learning to try and uh, you know, find new ways to understand the sport of Kabaddi. But I would also say look at teams because uh, you know, it's another avenue where uh, teams suddenly are splurging more money because there's more money coming back to teams. 
teams want to invest more to get more returns. They obviously see uh, data analytics as a big part of it. And therefore they see that as a, as a return on their investment as soon as they see uh, you know, the, the success of it. So I think don't limit yourself to just broadcast networks, but also look at teams around the world, not just with cricket, as Lisa said, but in other sports as well. And, and if your interests uh, lie there, I think there's a lot of opportunities, not just in the broadcast space, but in sort of alternative broadcast, which is now OTT as well. Thanks, Ahel. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks, Victor, as well, for that question. The, uh, the next question comes from Pradeep Raj. Do we have Pradeep on line? We do. Pradeep? Maybe he's gone for masala chai. <laughs> You're on. Are you, looks like you might be on mute, Pradeep. Pradeep, stop talking. We'll just read the question. We'll just read the question. Uh, so the question is for both panelists, uh, Sahel and Lisa. How uh, how you can how can you support wheelchair cricket in India and Australia? I actually met a few. Um cricketers uh it was in uh, where was i i was in the mumbai cricket association and one of the former indian female players came up and said oh um we've got a few of our wheelchair cricketers can you come across and meet them so i got a chance to meet them and hear their stories um and you know the hardship that they have just to to firstly get matches um to raise money to to play obviously it costs a little bit more because of the extra equipment and flights and everything else that goes with it. But um, I know here in Australia that um, we've got we've got certain programs uh, for disabilities, um, uh, blind cricket. So we're starting to see that Australian teams are forming for kind of each disability. So I, I would it, it's not that far away. Um, until we kind of see more international wheelchair cricket. I think it's important um, and one thing I love about sport is that it is a sport for everyone um, and it doesn't matter what race, what religion, what disability, what gender you are, um, sport can be inclusive and, and I'd like to think that cricket is certainly leading the way. Um, the, other, the other thing, the other way you can try and, and keep promoting it is you know, if more national teams do that, then, you know, from an ICC point of view, you get it into the state associations as something recognised, then national board and then the ICC. And, and all of a sudden there's a there's a decent pathway with um, more fixtures. But I understand it's a hard road, but um, it's amazing cricket to watch. Yeah, I'm just going to sort of sum it up in, in two words. I think uh, one, awareness and two, education. Uh, these are the two things I think that uh, we need to bring to not just wheelchair cricket, but I think a lot of uh, sports that are left by the wayside in India, but also uh, sports that need to be a bit more inclusive, right? I think uh, the stars of Indian cricket are, are so huge and we, we're, we've got them on a pedestal and, and, you know, they are demigods in our country. But I think it, it's down to awareness, firstly, to understand and to make people understand that there is wheelchair cricket around. I think, you know, people don't even know that it exists. Uh, and then it's to educate them about the hardships, as Lisa said, to understand about what it takes to even play the game, to understand their background, their stories. Uh, today, I think it's the responsibility of the boards, of private teams. Uh, if the Delhi Capitals, for instance, have a team going, I think it could also be their responsibility to, to showcase uh, wheelchair cricket in Delhi and even a little Instagram video or a couple of uh, Twitter uh, you know, tweets on, on it would, would just suddenly lift the entire diaspora of women's uh, or wheelchair cricket in, in the in a city and i think that in turn educates indian audiences and i think you, you understand the following that each of these teams have each of these cricketers have and i think this is a way to give back giving back is not just through coaching giving back is not just through um talking about the sport at, at various talks but it's to promote inclusivity within a sport and i think uh, this is one of the ways that cricketers and fast cricketers can do it Thank you, Sahel. Uh, the final question this evening comes from uh, Jatin Vanish. Uh, Jatin, do we have you on the line? I think so. It doesn't look like he's here. Uh, he was on. I saw Jatin on. He was? There was a Jatin, yeah. He's gone. He might have. We he didn't like your answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, this one was for you, Lisa. Um, so I might just ask it to you now. Um, how do we celebrate and flourish cricket in the new normal under these complex COVID protocols and uh, these these types of measures that are in place? How do we yeah, get together yeah. to celebrate as communities? Yeah, I think probably the IPL kind of started it off because you weren't able to go to the ground. And as Sahail was saying, the crowd, the noise. Um, I don't know what it was like back in India, whether, you know, people were, uh, well, I know the viewership numbers were massive and, and bigger, so that everyone w was glued to the TV. But um, I think the main thing is that um, the best way to celebrate it, and, and I think the athletes do it well in the sense that it's it's just another game of cricket. Yes, they'd love to play with, with the fans there and the crowd and the atmosphere, but when it's bat versus ball and there's a contest on the line and you've got Jasper Boomer bowling to Virat Kohli, it's game on. Um, and they celebrate it and, and play it the way it should be. So I think as fans, we celebrate and enjoy what we're seeing, which is what we've always loved to see about the game, um, is the contest and, um, and whether your team wins or not. So... I, I actually feel it hasn't changed a lot. For me, watching a game of cricket um, with fans there or not there, it, it doesn't mean any different to me or a bio bubble or not. When I watch a game of cricket, I am thoroughly engrossed in it and I would imagine close to a billion people might agree with me on that. No, indeed. And I think, um, I think we have a, a question from the High Commissioner for Sahel. Um, I've got a question for for, for Sahail, but but I say just say to Lisa that I actually think that you, you said this earlier, and I think it's true. Well, you didn't quite say it this way. Uh, I think the Australia India tests are bigger in Australia now than the Australia England tests. Um, they're more colourful. they yeah. you know. So I know you've got the Barmy Army, but you've got yeah. the Stormy Army. You've got those yeah. those Sikhs that turn up in pink turbans. It's I, I get a greater sense of satisfaction out of the the. the the, the atmosphere at, at Australia India matches in Australia than I do from Australia England, and I think it's because, um, and this is even more controversial, Lisa. I think the level of cricket is better between India Australia than than India England, and I think a lot of it has to do with Coley or Coley as Donald Trump used to call him, the, uh, um, because he plays cricket like an Australian. He plays on the front foot. He he he's as good with the lip as he is with the bat. Uh, and uh, you know it's it's good fun. So uh, that that that's my that's my commentary. Um, so Hale, I wanted to know because I've always wanted to ask this: How is it possible that Indians know so much cricket history? Three years ago, I walked through that's three cool. airports across India with Michael Kasprovitz, and we'd go past these twenty-year-old security guards, and they'd turn their heads, recognising Kasprovitz, and I said. What's that about? You haven't played for centuries. And, and he said, it's it's the TV channels here that just play repeats over and over again. He said they recognise me everywhere. So what is it about Indians and and repeats or what is it about Indians and cricket history? Is it is it is it part of the tradition? I think it, you know it comes down to a couple of things. One, I think unlike Australia, where you've got rugby at one season, you've got cricket at one point, you've got um, you know, soccer that goes on and you, you, you've got other sports that sort of take shape. In India, there's sadly, and I, I actually mean that, sadly, there's just one sport really that, that just sort of takes dominance. And now we're seeing a change slowly, but it's just been cricket until this point where maybe four years ago, cricket was also sort of uh, pushed aside at some points to see Kabaddi come in and to see football come in and things like that. And up until four years ago, there was nothing else. There was cricket, cricket and more cricket all year round and, and that's it. And so all of us would just be tuned in to watch every rerun that was on. I used to watch, I remember growing up watching Kenya versus Zimbabwe. I used to watch uh, a random Bangladesh versus, uh, you know, any other team. I, I remember my brother making fun of me because I had posters of Graham Thorpe and Andy Fla on my walls and not such a Tendulkar, right? So, I mean, this is a kind of sort of, uh, you know, history that we've got growing up. And and to me, the, the best India, Australia, um, memory is going to Chepok Stadium in Chennai watching Sachin versus Bourne in 1998 where he scored 155. I remember being there at the stadium and I was 11 at the time, right? So for me, that's sort of the, the, the memories that stem in and that sort of reverberates across India, right? You've got throngs of people that have had the same upbringing 
as me, which is watching sport, which equals cricket, and that's it for the longest time. And so in the next generation, I think we'll see less historians when it comes to cricket, but you'll see more kids that are tuned to more than one sport, which I think is a very healthy thing to have. Because I think we, we lost out on that, but we've gained, therefore, in diving so deep. And as Lisa said a lot earlier today, it's why we have an armchair expert in every living room in India on the game of cricket. And the difference, the other difference, Sahail, is that when, when I was 11, India was better known for hockey than cricket. <laughs> That's true. That is true. I'm not going to ask how long, for, how long ago that was, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think we've got um, just a few more minutes. So if there's anyone uh, who has a question for either of our panellists or for the High Commissioner, uh, please, this is your opportunity to, to ask. Uh, so if you could just unmute and maybe introduce yourself quickly and then ask the question. It's a one-off offer. It's a, <laughs> a one-off offer. Otherwise, you get back to watching the cricket. I'll jump in with the question. Okay. Okay. So hell, please. I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask Lisa a question actually, and it's one that that's been sort of troubling me for a while. Um, do you think that if you have a lot of men who are really invested in women's cricket? and have a keen interest that there could actually be more men and do you think the the involvement doesn't necessarily have to be only women in women's cricket from a broadcast perspective from a uh, from a perspective overall hang on sorry what was your question if you had more men involved in women's uh, cricket do you see that there could potentially um be more men involved also in women's cricket in terms of broadcast in terms of because it seems to be at this point i speak from a personal perspective for as someone who's been involved in the women's game as well that there's sort of a, a blockade somewhere. And I, I know you might sort of get this. There's sort of a blockade which says, oh, hang on, I don't think women's cricket is meant to be read by, by men. Where do you think that stands? How do you think we can sort of overcome that? Yeah, look, I'm a big, um, a big believer that the commentary box should um, look very similar to what the living room should look like. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's normally men and women watching the game of cricket together. Uh, so... I have no issues with any males commentating the women's game. Um, Ian Bishop, Alan Wilkins, yeah. um, uh, Harsha Bogle, uh, Sanjay Mandraka, you know, these guys do their research. If they pay the respect to do the research and learn about the women's game, um, as we do when we have to walk into the box to cover a men's game, then I have absolutely no issues whatsoever. I don't think it should be women only commentating on women's cricket and men only commentating on men's cricket. I just want a diverse panel, and, and that's obviously male and females, but also a broadcaster, a journalist, yeah. a batter, a bowler, and that you get a, a really good mix. And, you know, when I left the game and went into commentary, I thought I'd lost that team aspect. But one thing I found, and you would know, Sahail, is now being in the bio bubble, you create your own team in a broadcast point of view and it takes in an actual on-ground game, for those that don't know, over 100 people to get what you're watching to actually happen. And as a commentator, I'm just the face of that. But if I didn't have the audio, the switcher, the director, um, the runner getting us the food, then none, none of this happens. So it is a really big team um, and I'm all for diversity within that team. Yeah, well said. And, and you know, Lisa, just reflecting on that, you know, teams stick together, teams go through tough times. And I have to say to Sahail, to, to lose a fellow commentator and go on TV the next night, uh, that and, night. And to, to, to remind you of it with, 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 with the chair and the, and the coat, I thought was, you know, one of the bravest things I've seen anyone do, do because... I've got no idea how you got through the commentary. So congratulations, and it just demonstrates what you've just said, Lisa, that it's a team on the field and it's a team up in the commentary box as well. Yeah. Just to note that um, Pradeep uh, thanked us for raising his question, uh, the early question that, that we put the panellists. So just wanted to acknowledge that, Pradeep. Uh, finally, I think we have a question from Yogesh. Yogesh, would you like to unmute yourself and you're online? Thank you. Over to you, Yogesh. The anticipation is killing me. <laughs> yeah. 
I think we might have. I think, oh. I think he's got the circle of death. This, no? There's a orange exclamation mark in the top left-hand corner. It does not. I think it's, it's a big question. maybe. Question. When the maybe heat on. On. We know it's Delisa. Maybe he can type the question. Yeah. This has now got to be the world's greatest question. Here we go. Here we go. What challenges do you forecast for BCCI to introduce women's IPL and being an entrepreneur in the field of sports? What opportunities do I have to look out for? Well, you've got a lot of opportunities to look at. I'm not quite sure what you'd like to do. Um, so sign up for TV rights. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Uh, if you want to be um, principal sponsor, no worries. Um, <laughs> but I guess, I guess the challenges, um, and you take the pandemic out. The I guess the argument that I've heard from BCCI a number of times is that they're concerned about the depth. Um, now, when there's 33 states playing women's cricket and they've got junior teams as well. You've got enough players. Are they quality? Well, we don't know yet. We've, we, we haven't seen them. Um, but I think if you showcase a women's IPL, um, the standard is only going to improve, as we've seen it in the Women's Big Bash League, which has now had its sixth year, um, and the scores are going up, everything's going up in the right direction. You've got to start somewhere. <laughs> um, and uh, I kind of liken it to buying a house. You probably should have bought it yesterday, um, because you're going to earn a lot more from what it's going to be like in the next week instead of trying to save money to buy it outright. So um, I do really feel that um, the time is now to strike, and, and you can do it given the fact that there's no schedules um, at the moment on the Indian side, um, that you could actually go, why don't we start or finish with a women's IPL? It may not be eight teams, it may be six teams, and it may be a little bit shortened, but come out with a bang and make a statement. That's what I'd love to see the BCCI do. I'm just going to draw a parallel with uh, Indian football, actually, Lisa, because uh, we had the ISL, uh, and I was fortunate to be a part of the first season of that. And, uh, you know, we had massive names from around the world with Indian talent that was pretty ordinary, let's be honest, right, uh, at that stage. And there was the same fear, lack of depth, and there was a lack of depth. But you look at the ISL today, and six years or five years down the line, it's improved. We started with seven internationals, and no, sorry, six internationals and five Indians. It's then now flipped to just four internationals and seven Indians, right? And I think it's as simple as that. You, you saw suddenly when you've got that many international players around, the level raises, as with the IPL, as with the, the you know any other league that's going on across the world. And I'm with you. I think, you know, once you start, that's the only way to improve the standard. Uh, and yeah. I, I really liken it to, to the ISL because we saw that happening. And today, Indian football is better off for it. We're seeing a raise in standard. Uh, and it's going to be the same with, with any sport and especially with, uh, with women's cricket. And it, it'll bring eyeballs to the sport. And I think that's needed. Thanks both uh, to you, Lisa, and to you, Sahel. Uh, Look, I know we are slightly over now, just a minute over. Uh, we did start a little bit late, but we do have a quiz uh, which covers lots of uh, cricket questions which we'd like to to put to all of our participants. And I'm pleased to, to say that we do have prizes for the top three winners. So if you, if you think you know your cricket, uh, now is the opportunity to... Uh, to demonstrate that. So it's just popped up on the, the, the right-hand side of the screen for me. I hope it has all for you as well. We might just give everyone a little bit of time to, to work through those questions. No pressure to Hill or Lisa. Uh, oh, they're up here, okay. As, as the experts in the room. I love the first question. Um, got five minutes. And I should I should also note that you're not allowed to consult Google. We will we will know if you've consulted Google. I think I think we should give them two minutes for the question. That's okay. So. These are hard.
Australia. Oh, that's Australia. So I might take the hit. Do you get points if you go really quick? <laughs> well, we, we, it's given us a time limit, so. Oh, I'll take my time. I've submitted anyway. Do we know how many have been submitted? So once they're all submitted, we can. Yeah, just waiting on. Okay. I'm informed that you'll get an individual response once everyone has submitted. Oh. So we <laughs> There's a lot of guess what going on here. <laughs> Thought I saw you looking down, Sahail. Are you looking at your phone? Just typing a few things in? <laughs> well, I don't think it'll help me because by the time I type a question out, they're not the easiest questions to type either. <laughs> Probably two, there's probably two that I actually know from here. There's a lot of numbers, that's all I can say. Mm, big numbers. Yeah. There's Mithali, there's Bradman, those are the easy ones. <laughs> Anything with larger numbers is, is not going to be easy. Victor should be onto this. Victor will, will yeah. absolutely smash this one. If Victor doesn't win this, then there goes his uh, chance for doing yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so if people get the same score, it's then judged by who was in quickest. Is that the story? No, I, I don't believe there's any points. Sorry, for I like you thinking. Timeliness of responses, unfortunately. I know it's not going to be me. <laughs> Even I'm not old enough for most of these dates. <laughs> All right. The poll has ended. All right, so how do we find out the results? The results should go to individuals. I missed it. Can, can you take us through them? Just for the sake of. I believe our back of house team will be reaching out to. Here we go. Here we go. So 1895. New Zealand. There we go. No, it's all right. I'm confused. Oh, so it's got questions. But they haven't put up the results yet. Yeah. Okay. Generating a response. Well, I went with Australia because I figured we're here. There's a lot of Aussies here. I'm guessing there's a little bit of pride involved. Question two. So, Lisa, who do you reckon the first women's cricket team was against? England and who? England and Australia. There we go. It's come up for you, Sahel? No, I just thought I knew that one. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured that was too obvious, so I went for the Kiwis. <laughs> I don't know if we're playing tricks. I think they're, you know, they're not trying to stump us too much, except for, you know, how many clubs in Australia? Oh, that's right. One, two. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. It's coming on the main screen. Oh. We, we still need to know the accurate, the, the real answer. Yeah. So, Hema, that, that tells us how many people answered the question, but what's the correct answer? <laughs> yeah, that, that would be the, the key. I like how they're pulling us each up on each question as well, though. Oh, it's a lot of shame involved here. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I suspect we've used a survey, um, a survey uh, app, not a, not a quiz app. And the survey says? <laughs> the good news is we can be trusted if you prefer to do this or sit here all night watching the TV. <laughs> yeah, we can be trusted to advise by email who has been the top but three see, winners and, 
and deliver to them their their visa, their bottle of wine, or whatever the prize is. Yes, I think I think we might do that. And it's not a yeah. visa. I'll, I'll very, very, very competitive. We'll, we will we'll be in touch yeah. with everyone who's been uh, kind enough to 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 bear with us uh, through this with the results. Um, That's very intriguing. Oh, okay. No, we've get, we're getting in some live results here. Uh, apparently, the Australian High Commissioner, Sir Hale, and I don't, uh, Sudaka have been selected, well, not been selected, but have uh, responded uh, and had got the, uh, the most uh, correct responses. So, no well, way. Well, can, can I tell you why I guessed half of mine? <laughs> we'll be in, we'll be. So we'll be in touch. Anyway, look, we'll be in touch with uh, with all, everyone um, who's uh, who's won, and we'll also email out the uh, results. I like option two of the wine, thanks. Yeah, at least I can have my prize. As long as it's Australian wine. Yeah, and a nice reserve, maybe. A really old one. Exactly. It's worth a lot. <laughs> look, uh, uh, thank you very much for for taking the time to uh, participate in this uh, this event this evening. I'd just like to say before we wrap up that uh, I'm very pleased to announce that the second round of the Australian Alumni Grant Scheme is now open. We are looking for Australian alumni based in India seeking to make a difference in their professional fields of expertise within their communities or are keen to build stronger ties between India and Australia. This Pan India program provides up to 10 lakh seed funding to support alumni led initiatives across key sectors under the Australia India Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Previous recipients are completing projects in areas as diverse as cybersecurity, critical technologies, COVID clinical trials, clean energy, agri-tech, education, and science. We'll soon be releasing a series of short videos documenting the experience of these previous winners, as well as helpful tips for how to apply. So do follow us on social media and go to our website for further details. We will be accepting applications until Wednesday, the 10th of February, 2021. That's Wednesday, 10th February, 2021. If you have any questions, please contact your nearest Australian diplomatic mission in New Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata or Chennai. Now, thank you very much, High Commissioner. And obviously as well, thank you to Lisa and to Sahel uh, for joining us this evening and uh, for bearing with my terrible pronunciation of names. I do apologize. And also our tech. Um, thank you, of course, as well to all of our participants who have made the time and effort to join with us here today. Uh, and our partners at the Australian Alumni Association of India and its chapters across the country that keep the alumni community connected and engaged. Uh, that is it from us. Thank you very much. And we do hope that you have a very pleasant evening. And, and a good Christmas, a good New Year. And thank you again, Lisa and Hale. And Lisa, you will get you will get the prize. So <laughs> well, I've got no idea what the prizes were, but I'm just amazed, having guessed, <laughs> literally having guessed. I, I picked C for the last four and five answers. Thought it was easy. Well, I'm just going to say I missed one question and still was up there. So I, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to gloat there. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. There's always a nice personality in the bunch. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Pleasure. See you guys. Bye. Sure.